Okay, and we're live. Great stuff. So, everybody, this is the first uh, Webflail episode, and I'm very, very excited to have Melissa Mendes with me here. Um, and I've written a nice little little spiel about you, Melissa, which hopefully is accurate. So, Melissa Mendes is a <laughs> web designer and growth marketer based in Orlando, Florida. She went to study advertising at college, and after joined Datagram, a machine learning company that was growing really fast. However, the company's messaging didn't align with their visuals, and so Melissa redesigned and rebuilt their website with Webflow. It's her first website. Conversion rates skyrocketed, and the company grew even faster. Melissa then pursued making websites as a freelancer and kept growing consistently getting clients. She grew her skill set and started making more and more impressive websites using Webflow. Melissa started Eureka Studio with her husband, who is also a web designer. And earlier this year, she started the Webflow Party with Keith Armstrong. Webflow Party is a community of web flowers, teaching, growing, and sharing. And if you haven't joined and you're watching this stream right now, you need to go and do that. Um, it feels as if Melissa is now everywhere in the Webflow community, and it's hard to imagine she has had many failures along her journey as a freelancer. However, as with anyone who has pursued uh, their dreams and pushed their comfort zones to extraordinary degrees, like Melissa has, she has had her ups and downs too. There we go. There's my little intro, Melissa. <laughs> Was that actually? That was awesome. Thank you. It was like a story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you have yes, an amazing story. Yes, it was story. very accurate. Great stuff. And <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of lag, so I'm going to leave a few seconds pause in between one of us speaking, uh, which might look a little bit weird on this stream, but I hope that's okay. Is your internet fine? Um, I think mine is fine. Should I just disconnect my microphone and go with the earphone microphone? Maybe that's it. Should we try that? We could try that at the start of the interview. Why not? Yeah, let's try it. So okay. let's see. Okay. How about now? That's that's good with me. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, amazing. Let's I think try. We that. still have. The no. And we've got some. While, while you're doing some technicalities, we've got some. Everything is uh, my end. Yeah, all good. Melissa, are you there? I'm not sure if everyone can still see or hear me, but we've got some guests watching. We've got Robert, Ivan, Briona, Maria, and Lauren. So it's great to have you all here. Melissa's back. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things. No, it's absolutely fine. This is what I was kind of expecting going live for the first time ever on YouTube. I was kind of like, this could go really well, or we might have some technical issues. But this is what the podcast is all about. This is why I think it's so important to uh, yeah. show the realness of you know the people I'm interviewing, as well as the technicalities that no doubt we all have. So that is absolutely yeah. fine. That's absolutely fine, Melissa. Yes. And my first it happens. thought, it absolutely does. It's, it's just the way of life, I think. My, when I was researching you, yeah. you have such an incredible career. And before we get into the failures, what I'd really like to do is just to talk to you a little bit about some things that I've heard you say on different interviews, but I didn't really understand. For anyone that doesn't know who's watching this stream right now, what a growth marketer actually is. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me close all my my apps because I think maybe that could be the issue. Let me see. Okay. Okay, I'm closed. Okay. So you okay. want to know what a growth marketer really is? Yes. Yeah, so the difference between a regular marketer and a growth marketer is that a growth marketer approaches marketing as sort of like an iteration. And we use it more as a sort of like a scientific method because we don't go with an idea and just run with it. We iterate all the time. So whatever doesn't work, we just change it, uh, test new things. So it's like a, a constant evolving process. Um, and we try different uh, formats. So when a regular marketer would be stuck only on social media and print, let's say a growth marketer thinks um, sort of like outside the box. And I, I don't want to say, you know, that growth marketers are better than regular, but we just look at it from the, also from the technology side of things. So we'll try to do hacks, like a growth hacker. Uh, we'll try to use different alternatives to grow whatever it is that we're working on. So it's just more of, um, yeah, it's more like an experimental type of marketer. That's the difference in a nutshell. <laughs> Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And that also explains why Webflow was so useful when it came to redesigning Datagram's website, because you could try things and change things so quickly without developers, I guess. Is that is that reason why Webflow was so useful in that instance? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because, um, you know, before the website for Datagram specifically was done on WordPress and it needed developers to change it, to edit it and create new pages and even new sections. So for us at Datagram, it was just a total game changer that me as the growth marketer could go in and just change everything uh, myself and start testing, which is what the growth marketer does. So one of the things we did was create a content strategy. Um, I was the one writing content, like, you know, it's a startup. So I was wearing all the hats mm -hmm. and that was pivotal for us because it really changed the game in terms of traffic. It was a, a strategy that really worked for us. I was able to do it thanks to Webflow and the dev team was still working on the product itself. So definitely a game changer for us. And for me, um, I had my previous company before Datagram, which we can talk about that as well. And when I found Webflow more than Datagram for me, it was like, holy shit, this is going to change the game because I had been working with developers building product and literally everything had to be done by them. So when I saw that uh, Webflow, I was like, oh, I can at last do everything. You know, my first question was, can I do a marketplace on Webflow? How do I figure it out? Because that was, that used to be my company. So I don't want to like go away from your questions, but yeah, that, that was a game changer. No, that's that's fascinating. So I guess my follow up is is where would you be without Webflow? It seems to be such a huge part of your life now. And I'm just like, I'm just intrigued. Do you reckon you would have carried on at Datagram just doing growth marketing? Or do you think? Yeah, for yeah? sure. Yeah, really? I would have kept doing marketing. Yeah, because for me, technology, like me, making websites or making digital products was done. Like I sort of was resentful of, of all the, the challenges and the, and the, um, you know, all the problems that came with it, that for me, that was done. So I have, I was focused completely on being a growth marketer and a content creator on Instagram. Um, so when Webflow came in, 
it kind of gave me that spark, which is what I said in the in the docu docu series. I, and I was talking about that with Matthew, like uh, and Cena, which is the director of the docu series. Like mm. there was just a fire in me that started again, you know, like it kind of gave me hope again, like, oh my God, I can really do something fun, you know, and like apply my marketing experience and my design experience. And I'm just very creative or I consider myself very creative so I can apply that too. And business, I love business. So so I think I, I would definitely st still be a growth marketer and a content creator. That's so interesting. And so it sounds like Datagran and Webflow was kind of like a perfect mix. But tell us a little bit about what you did before Datagram, because you said you, you had a company. So I'm intrigued about that. Yeah. So when uh, this was back in 2014, I had I was a newlywed. And one day I was sitting down outside with my best friend, Marla, and we were um, talking and I was like, hey, you know what? I feel like I want to sell something. And then we started like brainstorming. We're drinking whiskey like at night. Like this was one of those conversations that you have with friends and they actually turn into something. And then we, as we started brainstorming, it was like, oh my God, why don't we bring stuff from China and like do a little shop. And then it's like, no, but what if people can actually open a shop there? We didn't even know we were creating a marketplace as we were talking. Um, then like they can upload their product and people can leave comments and all of that cool stuff. And then the next day I woke up and I was like, I can't stop thinking about this. So I still have like the notebooks and everything of like the profile uh, store and like everything. So little by little, I started getting more involved, involved in the idea. And we had gotten some like money from our wedding. And my husband, who knows that I'm completely insane, he's like, <laughs> go ahead, use it and like build your, your business. <laughs> And um, I hired a, an agency and we built the marketplace. So it was a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. So two-sided, the seller and the, and the buyer. And I wanted to be curated by me. So all the brands that came into the marketplace, um, I had to basically um, audit them or curate them. Uh, because I really wanted the products that were in the category of lifestyle. So home decor, fashion, um, yeah, like little pet stuff. Um, so I really wanted that quality to be really good. And mm -hmm. little by little, it just started growing and growing until we got to 5,000 users. But that wow. process was insane because it was a very bloated operation um and that's just uh the fails that i'm gonna talk about here <laughs> okay so i was gonna say this sounds like it segues really nicely into the first failure so anyone that's watching may not have understood the, this concept but essentially um i've asked melissa to send me what she considers to be her three biggest uh, failures as a creative entrepreneur before we started the podcast. So Melissa was a little bit nervous about bearing all. And I hope that, um, you know, if, if there's anything you feel uncomfortable talking about, Melissa, then um, do just say. But um, yeah, the first the first failure. Yeah. Do you, do you want to yeah. say it or shall I say it? Uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay, then. The, the first failure that Melissa wants to talk about is financial responsibility um so i guess off the back of the comments that you just made about putting your marriage money into this business is that is that linked yeah well yeah everything is linked so when i um started the process of eureka obviously i hired an agency and I remember for them to build the marketplace at that time, it was like $8,500. So like $8,000, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
um, I didn't really have any financial literacy. And I've always been very bad with math. Like I was horrible at math in school. And I'm more like an English history type of art person. So for me, money didn't really make sense. Like it was mm. just there and more was coming. So as the company evolved, I was just draining our bank accounts without any responsibility whatsoever. I didn't know what revenue was, profit, profit margins. Um, at that time, I remember, you know, trying to find out like how to do accounting. And that's another thing that it's important for people to know. You can't do everything. But as a first time business owner, you kind of, if you're somebody like me, you want to take on everything. Mm -hmm. so, so at that moment, I thought that I had to do everything because I couldn't afford hiring, let's say, an accountant. So long story short, for four, five years, I was just paying for advertising with credit cards, paying for developers with credit cards. Um, the company wasn't making enough money and I was still going for it, you know? because I was just so convinced that this was going to be it for me that I was just like, F it, I'm just going to go for it and the money mm -hmm. will come, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I think for me that really put um, a strain personally because I became super depressed, super stressed, and I gained a lot of weight. Uh, I didn't even know like why, what was the reason, but it was because I was just stuffing my face all day with the stress. Wasn't working out because I was working 24 seven because I needed to cover those costs. And um, little by little, it started also putting a strain on my marriage. You know, I wasn't paying attention to my husband because I needed to be locked up in the office working you know, running a marketplace that has 5,000 people is intense. Like you have to make sure shipping is done and, and sales and, you know, I was just every, every department was me. And, um, and I think that that was the main issue why I ended up deciding to close it. Because I said, no more, I'm either going to like go bankrupt and lose my husband or, or I, I have to close this thing, you know? So, so yeah, I, I think that that was, that's, that's a huge, huge factor for people that are looking to open a, a company. And I feel like what I learned from that was understanding that first you can't do everything. Um, second, there will always be a little bit there to hire somebody to help you do the numbers on your company. Even if you are a one person agency, a multiple person agency, or a freelancer, I would 100 suggest if you can do it, hire somebody else to help you um, investigate what are the cheapest way to do this, to do things. Like if you're deciding to open a tool, like try to get a, a free version before paying for something premium. And even like little stuff, like if you're going to open a company in the US, there's different entities that you can open. And um, the way you file taxes, also there's ways that you can cover yourself for the, for the future. Those are things I didn't know about. And, and people really don't tell you these things, you know? So, so be very smart. Always try to be very stingy about your money uh, when, when it comes to business and, and, and hire out, hire out people to help you. Wow. Okay. There's so many questions to branch off from this. Um, I mean, can we, if we were to just rewind a little bit. So, what was your husband doing at this point? Because I think this is something that's not really talked about enough. Like there's a partnership that, you know, creates um, someone like you. I mean, you know, you're obviously a very strong individual, but you clearly have like a, a really um, great partner who, who can, 
you know, help you get through tough times and, and sees you at your best and sees you at your worst and, and helps you kind of navigate life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what was he doing at this time and how did, and how did he help support you as well? So he's like the best person ever. Like he's just a uh, very calm. I'm the crazy one. And he's just the, the calm one in the, in the relationship. So he was always in the back, like supporting me, mm. um, you know, every, celebrating every win. But then as the bank account started draining, he's like, okay, wait, like what's wrong here? But I'm such a strong personality that I would just justify everything. You know what I mean? Mm. To the point that he would kind of stay quiet and just take it. You know what I mean? Because he wanted to support me so bad and he believed in me so bad. Um, so yeah, like he was just in the, in the back, like trying to push through and, and support me until we couldn't go anymore. He's the real MVP here. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We'll have to send him that little clip right now. So, I mean, I think this is something that's not often talked about enough because entrepreneurs, there's all these kind of sayings like you know the only time a business fails is when the founder quits and things like that yeah you obviously there was a point when enough was enough and Mm -hmm. it had got so far that you were like okay we need i need to stop this because something has to change can you can you talk to us a little bit about that point if you yes i remember perfect Um, we were having a lot of trouble, me and him and like fighting a lot and, and he's very quiet. So like, we were just not communicating too much. And I called a friend, she's one of my best friends and she's a a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And I told her, um, you know, I'm frustrated because he doesn't want to help me in the business. Like, I don't know about money. Like he needs to help me. And my friend told me an advice that I will never forget. It's so simple, but I never thought about it. And it was that your husband, your partner shouldn't be living your dream. Like your dream is yours for you to fight for. And he has his or he or or her has their own dreams and they should be able to go after those. Like when you're in a relationship, each one has their own life, let's say, but you share that life and you shouldn't be um, pushing the other person to come and support you because that's just not their job. So when she told me that, everything clicked for me. And I remember going back to the apartment and sitting on the, on the, on the bed and I was like, I just want to tell you that I'm done. Like, I'm done with this business. I'm going to close it. Um, I'm not going to eliminate it completely because maybe in the future something will happen and I'll just reopen it. But as of right now, that's the decision I'm making. I ask for forgiveness, obviously, you know, um, and that was it. I, I remember that when I closed it, I went into like a crazy depression. Like I was crying like, for two weeks and I didn't want to go anywhere. And I didn't know, I didn't really understand that the depression was like kind of letting go of like a baby because this had been my life. Yeah. And after the two weeks, I was like, damn, that's crazy. Like I just mourned this business, you know, it was insane. <laughs> it Okay. It is insane a little bit, but it also resonates with me a lot. Um, very recently, I had a conversation with my girlfriend who said, look, you work too much. And I was like, no, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to make it happen and for us and stuff. And she was like, it's not for us. You're doing it for you. Mm-hmm. And like, we need to differentiate and set boundaries between, you know, what what I want and what you want. And it was like, I think a very similar kind of moment. Um, exactly exactly yeah Yeah. we don't we think that we're doing this for our family because we want to support them and buy a better house or whatever it is but in reality it's all in our head yeah for us yeah and I think sometimes 
they just want your time and attention. Yeah. They just want to watch Shrek with you or whatever exactly. it is. Like it's not actually more complicated than that. Yeah. If anyone, the, the chat is absolutely buzzing. We've got some really supportive comments coming through. Um, Breonna I'm said, reading them. Oh, you can read them as well. Great. Yes. Yeah, supportive partners. Yeah. In fact, I'm just going to put that up there. Supportive partners don't get enough credit in the space. There are glue. I absolutely love this comment. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people in the Webflow community who have huge personalities and they're clearly very, very good at what they do. But I would love to see, you know, how, how their partners uh, play a part in their success as well, because I can't help feeling that, you know, a lot of the time um, people that are truly successful have supportive people in their life, whether that's a partner or family or whoever. Um, exactly. And I think speaking of this, this actually segues really nicely into mm -hmm. the second failure, um, which is very interlinked, which is hustle culture. Can you tell me a little bit about why you see, you know, you failing uh, with, with hustle culture? Yeah. So obviously I was the one person doing everything. So I was marketing, sales, accounting, dev team, product, everything. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough hours in the day. And that's just not how you should do things. Um, so I was working 24 seven, like when I was about to go to bed at 2 a.m. with my eyes that wanted to pop off my fingers because I had like a large following on social media and customer service was there. And it was just like, I was getting like arthritis. Like it was just horrible. Mm. And even at 2 a.m. in the morning, I was answering emails. I would go to bed thinking about it, not even pay attention to my husband and then wake up and keep going. I would mm. miss, you know, hang out with him and his, and his daughter, my stepdaughter, um, I would not go to places because I needed to pack stuff and ship or I would obviously work over the weekends. Mm. And not only does that kind of like uh, create like, a, like a, a break in there because you, you're not sharing special moments, but you start getting like social anxiety too, you know, like then when you go out, you don't even know how to act because you haven't seen people in so long. Yeah. You, you were saying on, on Instagram, I think, or Twitter, that now that you're working on a co-working space, you, your mental health has improved. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it, it's crazy, you know? You have to look at people, go out. Like, I'm more of a home person, but, but that really affected me because I didn't know how to act, and I just didn't want to go out, you know? So... Now I am super conscious of that. And by 5, 6 p.m. on Friday, I close my computer. And unless I am doing something because I really feel like this is just a fun project, I do not open my computer until Monday. So that really, really taught me to be very, very careful with how I spent my time, how to optimize my time. Because at that time, it was just 24-7. And, and another thing is, that was that trend. You know, that's when being a girl boss was hot and killing it was hot. And, you know, working to, uh, nine, nine to five, 24 hours a day, 24-7 uh, was hot or cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm always somebody that kind of follows the, the wave um, until I realize that it's bullshit. And that's what I was doing. So, so be very, very careful of that. I know right now people are trying to promote not that, which is amazing. Um, so, yeah, I think that that was one of my biggest fails too. Yeah. And that also makes me think of, um, you know, being on social media, there are a lot of people who share their wins, which is great, but it can sometimes make you feel insignificant, insecure. And I think as someone that obviously spends a lot of time on social media um, with both Webflow Party, but also I imagine your business, you're probably doing outreach and stuff like that. How could you, how, how would you give advice to anyone watching now about 
how not to feel or kind of give in to this like hustle culture type thing that maybe is the negative side of social media. But I think we've all got people on our feeds that sometimes just make us feel small. Mm-hmm. How, what advice would you give to those people? I would say have clear boundaries. Um, and that starts from the moment that you get your first project. Like set clear expectations with the client uh, to know when you're going to deliver a project, starting with the most basic things, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and having in mind that you won't work over the weekends. Like even if there's a mistake on your part, you should try your best to not work over the weekends or choose at least two days during the week to not work, whether that's on the weekend or on the week. Um, So setting clear, clear expectations is super important. Um, There's like a a little bit of uh, controversy on that whole sharing your wins on social media. I think that a way that maybe I would like to see it is I won because I did this because I, you know, I covered uh, the mistakes that I had done before. And this is how I got there, you know, instead of just making it sound like tacky, like, oh, here I am. I just won my biggest contract. You know, I actually saw one of those today and I was like, I mean, I'm happy for you. But like you said, there's a lot of people in the Webflow party that haven't even gotten one project. How do they feel? You know what I mean? Like, it's just a little bit rough on my end. And it's just the delivery of it, I think. That's just very, like, self-centered. I'm in social media all the time because that's just part of who I am. And and I like it. I enjoy it. I'm not that person that gets, like, frustrated and has to, like, get out of social media for, like, two weeks to breathe again. Uh, But I think that controlling your screen time could be beneficial. I know Brianna, who's here, uh, she does that and it works for her, you know. So ultimately, it's just boundaries, like knowing when when to stop, when when it's enough. Yeah, definitely. And that makes me think of some advice that um, I've seen another freelancer give. I forget who now, but essentially unfollow people that make you feel like shit celebrate your wins but you kind of need to like ah it's like getting rid of bad exes it's amazing they just disappear and then you never hear about them and uh, the other yeah and then the other thing that i think is really helpful is finding a group like an accountability group of people that are around your level and that's where the webflow party comes in so I think it's so important to mention here because if you're not part of the Webflow party and you're watching and you're at the start of your Webflow journey, please join the Webflow party. Mm -hmm. I'm plugging it. Melissa's not plugging it. I am saying it's really (laughs) For real. This is like the real plug. (laughs) (laughs) Melissa can pay me later, but it's honestly so, so useful if you're at the start of um, of your Webflow journey just to see people that are actually like you rather than going on Twitter. And it can just feel quite overwhelming sometimes when you, you know, follow the big, big Webflow players. Also, let me say something here. I want to, I want to say 100% unfollow people that you don't vibe with. I've muted a lot of people on Twitter that I'm just like, I cannot even deal. Uh, And on Instagram too. But um, I think that what you were saying of, I think I forgot what I was going to say. (laughs) <laughs> what were you saying at the end <laughs> uh i was saying that find a group of people that are around your same level was were you going to say something about that with the webflow party said, i think it was the topic before i don't remember what it was but oh well whatever damn okay. it was important i'm sure it will come will it come back uh, maybe yeah <laughs> okay. well we'll we'll riff and maybe it will surface mm-hmm. up again. i feel like there's a lot of like similar strands that we're covering yeah. here that I'm sure a lot of people are feeling. Brianna says, yeah, boundaries are so important. Uh, ready designer one, work-life balance is so tough. It's speaking of, because I feel like this is actually quite important to talk about. You've got two businesses. You've got Eureka. You've got Webflow Party. 
Or maybe they're not businesses. Per se. I mean, Eureka is, but... I, I remembered what I was going to say before we jump into that new topic. Yeah, okay. let's do that. Let's jump back. Okay, guys. And I'm saying this to everybody here. All those winners you see on TikTok, most of the time they have 30 problems in the back. You know what I mean? Like they make it sound like it's everything is nice and dandy, but maybe they're having trouble paying payroll or covering, I don't know, taxes. Like there's always something else. So what you see of people saying, oh my God, we just killed it and did this. Just always remember that there's some hidden problem that they're dealing with. They're just not saying it because they want to either celebrate, share, whatever, or just, you know, tell everybody that they're, they're doing amazing. But there's always something. Yeah, agreed. I think everyone has things that they want and can't have and, you know, in all different areas of life. Mm -hmm. um, but linked to this hustle culture topic, I mean, you've obviously become a lot better at boundary setting, but with starting the Webflow party, I mean, naturally you're taking on, you know, that's a large chunk of your time. I'm just intrigued. Do you have strict boundaries with both different aspects of your life? And are they kind of 50% of the time, like mornings I work on Webflow party, afternoons I work on Eureka or how do you kind of manage that? Because that must be quite hard to play against this hustle culture, you know, yeah. hustling, right? Well, well, okay. So definitely boundaries. Like I don't work on anything during the weekend, whether that's the web flow party, whether that's Eureka. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I don't have a structure of times that I work on either thing. Because I've found that for myself, when I have a structure so strict, I get bored of things. Um, I do the Webflow party because I absolutely love it. Like, it's really like a hobby for me. So I don't have like a boundary of, of let's say, I'm, or maybe I do have a boundary of how many events maybe I'm doing a week because I have to work. Um, if it was for me, I would do one every single day, you know, but, but I do have a boundary for that. Um, and then sometimes if I see that definitely, you know, I need to put more work into Eureka that week, then I'll just simply don't, don't do, uh, the Webflow party, uh, which I've, I've had in the past. I think we haven't had a couple and that that's when they were on Saturday, um, so what, what I love about the Webflow party is that everything has happened so organically that I don't really stress out if I can't make it to a live stream. I always have Keith, who's my partner on this. Um, he's super supportive. And if I were to tell him like, Hey Keith, you know, I need you to cover the party this week, he'll 100% do it. And he also helps me a lot with the back end of things. So I don't have all of the pressure. Eric Odom now came in to help as producer for live streams. Super important. Mm -hmm. um, so little by little, people from the same community have been coming to me offering for help. And I think that that would, will start helping me, you know, let go a little bit of things um do more stuff and then that way I can just be a host and like sort of like the leader of it where I communicate things but I don't have to be like you know every day creating yeah. the smaller tasks okay awesome that makes a lot of sense but it sounds like from your experiences with you know before uh datagram doing your business you've learned the importance of boundaries and you apply that to every aspect of your life mm -hmm. which has completely changed how, how your life works, right? Like it, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so important to learn boundaries. And the importance of saying no off the back of that, I think is very hard for freelancers generally to, to say. You know, it's not a word you're taught to say very much as a, as a kid. Um, and so as a freelancer, I think it's kind of hard to like almost retrain yourself to be like, actually, no, like this yeah. is kind of what I want to do. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of overlooked, but as a freelancer, one of the most important 
words that I've found to say is actually no, ironically. I mean, yeah. Um, Sometimes you... I see on Twitter over the weekends, I see guys like, guys, how do I do this on Webflow? I'm working on a client and I can't do this. And I'm like, man, like, why are they working over the weekend? Obviously, maybe <laughs> it's a, you know, deadline that they have to fail, whatever. But I'm always like, why? Like, just take the weekend off or work, do your passion project, you know, if you if that's what's just fun for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really hard lesson to learn. But I think this brings us on. Very, this has flowed so well. I'm so <laughs> pleased how this has gone. Um, this brings us on to the third failure that you, you want to talk about, which is naivety. And is this naivety at the start of your Webflow career or, you know, where no. That... So, so I, when I first started my other company, I was just so naive because I just knew that I was going to be successful. Now, success really is something that is very personal. What could be successful for me? Maybe it's not for you. Uh, but I, I thought in my head that I was going to be the ne next Jeff Bezos. And I see that happening in a lot of young people that haven't been hit hard um and because you go into it thinking i'm the best there's no way i'm not i'm not doing this like i'm a superhero <laughs> and the moment really humbles you and that's the moment that you realize like damn like i was very stupid you know what i mean like i i had all the signs in front of me I was doing everything wrong, or no, not everything wrong, but like a lot of things wrong. And I was still believing that I was just going to make it. You know what I mean? So I think that my advice uh, for that is being very humble. Like I love people that are humble, noble, you know, kind. And I always talk about that. It's because of that, because you, even if you feel like you have all the skills, that you're very smart and you have it, have it going for yourself, always have that humble, humbleness there because you never know what tomorrow could bring. I know this is a very broad advice, but, but I see it every day. I see it every day in young, in young people uh, on agencies and freelancers. Like just bring it up a notch. You can still think that you're awesome, but just like calm down, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting. So say hypothetically, someone was watching that was one of these quite overconfident, um, like, you know, young, young, young web flowers, which there are a lot of on social media kind of shouting about their wins and stuff. And you're kind of like, I mean, how many years have you been using Webflow? You look about 12. Um, <laughs> So uh, what advice would you, is, is, I think sometimes, um, you know, when someone says, hey, you should be, you should act more humbly. Like, what does that actually mean? What, what advice would you give someone who, who maybe was a bit over um, confident? How should they act and differently to how they are? Um, usually when somebody acts like that, it's because they're trying to reflect something inside of them. Yes. And they learn that from somebody else that is also grown uh, or feeling themselves grown. So they're trying to mimic that personality or that attitude. Mm. So what I would say to that person is look around, really do an introspective look of, you, of yourself. Well, um, and analyze who you really are, where you came from. You know, it doesn't matter if you just closed a hundred grand contract, you're still that boy that grew up in a whatever street, you know what I mean? Or in a whatever house. And that's who you always should be. Like somebody that treats the garbage person and Bill Gates the same. And somebody that can eat in a five-star Michelin restaurant and somebody that can eat in a corner uh, barbecue place. So for me, that's what it, what it is, just being open with people, being kind, um, understanding that wins come from very hard work. They don't come because people think that you're the shit. They come because people have literally sweat their ass off, 
probably had not uh, set boundaries. They had to work over time. <laughs> save, save, save. Be very smart. Read and all that that stuff. And that's why they're there. So it's not because, you know, one day to the other, you just woke up and, and had a bunch of money. And, and people think that that's just what happens. I have friends, people that I know that literally think like that. And, and their comments are always, oh, I want to win the lottery. No, bro. You don't have to live, win the lottery. You have to work your ass up. That's what you need to do. And that's what I think. <laughs> you know, being, being with your feet on the, on the, on the earth. Yeah. Yeah, that I makes sense. I win out of tangent, but that's what I think. No, that's, that's really good. Yeah. Marcelo is just commenting, saying overnight success takes years. And I think that's exactly what you're describing. Like anyone that's got a big win, um, probably has taken years to get there and it's it's really really important to recognize that but yeah. i also think there's people who are in webflow i've noticed that a lot of agencies um sometimes look really big but actually when you speak to the agency it's like oh no it's just it's just me mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like oh okay right yeah. got this website that looks really impressive <laughs> um which which is really it's, I mean, obviously, you know, that, that's important for their business success, but it's just a really interesting scenario where people who are freelancers set up as an agency. Um, you know, okay, so that is something interesting to look at because as a marketer, you translate that as that person be, be, being very good at marketing. So when you have a business, you have like three pillars, which is operations or production, um, the account, accounting part of it, and then marketing. Mm. Usually as a business owner, you're very good at two things, but not always the three things. So when you see a small company that seems really big, it's probably because that business owner, whoever is in charge of the image of the company is really good at marketing. Mm. You know what I mean? That used to happen with me on Eureka, um, a, on the marketplace. People thought that we were like our headquarters were in a building in freaking New York. And what they didn't know, it was that it was literally me with a bun on my head, sitting <laughs> in my pajamas <laughs> on my in-laws computer, just like masterminding the whole thing. Wow. So you really... If you have the vision, you can make your company look huge and beautiful, but that's just all marketing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think there's a lot of amazing, amazing marketers out there um, that I'm following, um, which, it, you know, are really inspiring. But also sometimes when I talk to them about work, they're like, oh, yeah, it's, like it's just a guy in his underpants. And you're just like, OK, right. I thought you were, you know, a <laughs> massive agent. Yeah. really weird. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, sorry, I feel like we're going a little bit off tangent. We have, um, covered a hell of a lot. Um, and I feel like this has been kind of like a group therapy for people in the comments. A lot of for people real. are meeting with this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, when you ask these type of questions, you don't really know, you know, how deep you're going to go, but you have, you know, ex like shared a hell of a lot and, um, it's been really, really fascinating to, understand your story um and through the lens of failure because i think everyone here you know absolutely loves you and you are like the hype oh, you're gonna make me cry am i no, about to cry I mean, on, no, live, on live stream <laughs> you can cry on a live stream that's what it's all about um i feel like you know everyone is is seeing you as the perfect person and i'm not you know, no. I think it's healthy to, I'm not saying that you're not perfect. Sorry, I don't mean to be offensive, but it's great to hear, you know, the things that, that didn't quite work uh, that have made you who you are. And I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, no, so, but, yeah. but, but please, like, I'm, I'm like, you know, like, I wish you could tell this to my husband right now, because he would be <laughs> like, she's not perfect. Come on, stop. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't think that I'm a marketer, guys. So I know how to market myself. Like you also can learn that and I can teach you stuff like that, you know, like 
how to present yourself, how to talk, how to read people. Like those are things that you learn as a marketer. Um, mm. And also like, you know, being charismatic, those are things that are kind of connected um, that make you look like that. But I'm not like that. I'm grumpy. I am irresponsible. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> okay, well, that's really, really sweet of you to say that. And is there anything... Um... Is there anything that you're like learning or reading at the moment that you'd really recommend or podcast maybe? Is there something that you're particularly like looking at right now that you'd recommend other people in the Webflow community should should look at and, and also take interest in? Um, I think that, so I, I'm sort of like Buddhist. I'm not like officially, but, but I, I really love learning about it and I read a lot about it. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage that to people for just your way of life, um, being very intentional with the things that you do and going at everything, even if it's cleaning your house with all your heart, because that really changes your perspective of things. Because instead of saying, I um, like, I have to do this. It's more like I'm, I am going to do it because I enjoy to do it. Like literally, even if it's, you know, sweeping your house. Um, and for me, that really has helped me a lot in just being more present, being more kind, thinking that everything around you has a soul. Um, and that in also turns you into a very grateful person. So I would encourage people if that's something that you are interested in, to read about it you don't have to be like you know change your religion or whatever because i haven't but i use that as my way of life as your compass direction okay mm -hmm. that's really interesting yeah. um so i mean we have we're coming up to the hour mark and i don't want to keep you too long because i know that you have strict boundaries <laughs> which is very important to respect um if anyone wants to write anything in the comments, uh, you know, any last questions before we before we wrap this up, we could do a little Q&A at the end. Um, if anyone is writing question, crack on. But before we end, Melissa, is that do you want to talk a little bit about the Webflow party for anyone that's watching that's not part of it? You know, what is it? Where can they join? And, you know, how can they follow you on social media as well? Yeah. So the Webflow Party is a community of designers and developers that we're all together trying to be better designers and developers. Um, as everybody know here, we use Webflow and usually we incorporate that into the, the weekly parties that we have virtually. Um, but we also try to incorporate other types of uh, tools and methodology to do just things better. And if you want to join, uh, you can find us on Twitter. It's Webflow Party. And the link is right there for our headquarters, uh, which are on Circle. Uh, and that's it. That's a little bit of the Webflow Party. Awesome. And then if they want to follow you on Twitter. So my Twitter is Meli Del Mar 06. You can find me there. And then on Instagram, it's Melissa Del Mar Mendez. Awesome. That's epic. They should follow you. You always put up really helpful content and actually cover a lot of the stuff we talked about today in your Instagram stories and things like that. Yes. So I really recommend um, having a look at that. There's no questions coming in. Oh, there is. If you could go back in time, what one piece of advice would you give yourself when starting your web journey? Great question. Mm. Okay, so um, because at that time, Webflow was, wasn't a thing, I would say try to find the, the, the least expensive solution so you don't have to hire out web work. Um, that's like in my case, because I feel like Either I learned how to code or I had to hire people. But if I would have been smarter, I think I would have found the solutions that would still work for me and I didn't have to come out of pocket so much. And that really connects with what I was saying about um, 
you know, when you're looking for a membership, let's say Figma, you don't have to pay for it. You can use the free version. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like try to go as, as lean as possible at the beginning. Great advice. So we've, I think that's all the questions there. So to wrap up, three failures that Melissa talked about were financial responsibility, hustle culture, and naivety. And we learned so much setting boundaries, trying to be lean at the start, guys. That's what we want to do from the get-go. Think about the free options before splashing out and paying loads of money. Join the Webflow party. If I haven't said it enough, go and join the guys. It is well worth it. Wait, There's you missed and get an accountant. Get, get an, an accountant. accountant. Get an accountant, <laughs> number four. I feel like there's about 20 things that we could. I don't have enough fingers for the amount of, <laughs> amount of learnings that we had. But yeah, basically, I'm really, really glad that people got so much out of it. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing so abundantly your amazing advice and knowledge. And for showing that, you know, people who are kind of at the top of their game um, have mistakes and that's what shaped them to be the success that they are today. So I think that's that's really, really important. Is there anything else that you'd like to end with, Melissa? Um, honestly, I loved this podcast. You really should keep doing it. You know, there's, I'm sure, a lot of people that would love to share their stories and we can learn from them as well. I can't wait for the next episode. I want to thank you for always supporting me. For everybody that doesn't know, Jack actually reached out on Instagram and sent me like a voice note and it was just so nice. And from there, we've been friends. Now he's on the Webflow party. So like send that DM and Jack, thank you so much for always supporting me. Like I'm super, super grateful. This was super awesome. And I'll be supporting you on the next episodes. Very excited. Epic. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> Send DMs to your heroes, guys. That is the final one that we will leave this on. But thanks so much. I'm going to end the broadcast now. So have a great day, guys. Bye. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. Bye. <laughs>